Welcome to episode 15 of the See Through Podcast, a podcast that creates transparency on disabilities and the champions with them. My name is Lance and I am your host. Today's guest features Noah Mbuyamba, based in the Netherlands. Noah is a full-time medicine student and Paralympic athlete. Noah has a limb deficiency due to losing his right lower leg in a scooter accident while he was on vacation in Indonesia. While hospitalized for his injury, a nurse suggested that he could become the next Blade Runner, which is the fastest runner with a prosthetic limb. That comment sparked Noah's current journey to become a Paralympic athlete. You'll hear all about Noah's amazing story, his diet and training regimen, and much more on this episode. So let's just get into it. Here's my conversation with Noah. Enjoy. What's up, Noah? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're in the Netherlands. I had a a very hard time calculating the time zone difference. (laughs) (laughs) I can imagine. Like six hour difference. Yeah, it's nice to connect. So what are you up to today, man? I trained this morning. Okay. With, uh, yeah, with the, his name is Dr. Ludidi. He made the books about fasting, intermittent fasting. And he's, uh, he also does personal training. He knows a lot. So he helped me in my training. And we talked about the nutrition and also techniques and lifting and how he can help me. So that was really nice. After that, I did my job. I cut some hair. Oh, you cut some hair? Yeah. yeah. As a barber. And um, you got some I, nice hair, man. Thanks, man. Thanks. Man. <laughs> it's a shame people can't see. Oh, they'll see, man. I'll, I'll I'll post a picture of you so people will have a good idea of of your hair, man. I think I you got some strong hair going. People have to see it. <laughs> so yeah, that sounds really interesting about you. You training with that doctor who you said he created intermittent fasting. Yeah, he created a book about oh, it, like nice. his his own method of intermittent fasting. Interesting. Like intermittent fasting, it's just a principle. It's not something you can still create. It's already there. But he made his, uh, he created his method of doing it. Oh, right on. Yeah, I've done a, I've I've done a few months of intermittent fasting before to kind of help me shed some pounds and. Yeah. It works. It works. Yeah, true. But lately, man, I've just been, I've been eating breakfast. You know, right when I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but we can. We can chat more about like get more in the weeds about like your training and and uh, how you train and the specifics of that later on. But I think you know for the the listeners out there um, who who may may not be familiar with you, could you walk them through like give give yourself a little intro who you are and uh, what you're up to these days? Yeah, I'm Noah, a uh, 22 year old medical student. Uh, I'm in a gap here right now because I have a, I have a special dream. Uh, I got amputated three and a half years ago, and after that, I I looked for a new passion, and I found a track and field. So I decided that I wanted to compete in the uh, in the Paralympic Games and eventually win. So I'm focusing on that right now. Yeah, I'm on a good schedule, and it's, it's going well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and you, uh, you you mentioned you're an amputee and you're training for the Paralympics. What specific event in the Paralympics? I'm training for the 100 meters. Okay. And eventually I also get into the long jump, but I haven't really been practicing that a lot. Nice. Yet, so for me it's the 100 meters. That's also where my passion lies and what has been my goal from day one. So Awesome. That's what I'm going for. So that's speed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I have never had. <laughs> I I played football in in high school. I, I think my best forty yard dash time I think was a four point nine eight. So I guess it's not the worst, but you know, compared to you know the fastest people. Run, yeah. yeah, I know. Like most NFL like cornerbacks, they run like four threes. Yeah. You know things like that, but. But yeah, I'm always fascinated by that kind of those numbers and things like that. So 
you're training for the Paralympics. Does that feel kind of bizarre to you? Like, cause you know, you, you're a leg amputee. You were born, you know, with both legs, you've lost your leg in an accident. It's probably something you never thought you were going to be doing is training for the Paralympics. No. Can you walk me through kind of the origin story of how, how you lost your, is your right leg, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. My right leg. You don't have to go into to the deep details on it, but I think people listening might be interested in to know like kind of your story with your leg. Mm-hmm. So as I said, three and a half years ago, uh, I went on holidays with two friends of mine. It was my first, uh, first year holidays on my own. So, and we, we went to back, backpack in uh, Indonesia and the plan was to go for four weeks. And at, in the fourth day, we, uh, we rented some scooters to go to the beach and uh, I drove one of the scooters with my best friend in the back seat and the other friend was driving the other scooter. And at some point uh, of the trip, it was a 45 minute trip and we were driving for like 30 minutes and everything was fine. At some point, I just, uh, yeah, I lost control. I, I don't know what happened, but I ended up on a off road and just, just a little bit off road, like, half a meter off road and uh, there I couldn't get the scooter back on the, on the road again. And then we hit a tree. Uh, apparently I had the internal bleeding, but they didn't see that in the first hospital. So they sent me out. Then we went to the second hospital. They, I think they knew what I had, but I don't know why they didn't help me. They told me a few days rest and I would be fine. So I went to the last hospital, uh, to the third hospital. That was day three already. And I stayed there for two more days uh, without getting any help. So after five days, it was, so, it was way too late to save my leg. And uh, they flew me over to Singapore. And at that point, it was a matter of saving my life instead of trying to save my leg. It was already far gone, but like I, I almost got into septic shock. Like my... Uh, my own leg got it, rot, it rots. Like in five days, it rots, and uh, yeah, my kidneys and my liver started to shut down. Then they saved uh, saved me by amputation, and uh, from there on, I started to look for a replacement for football for uh, soccer uh, because that was a uh, that was my biggest passion before, and. Uh, then I got into track. I went to a talent day, like three months after amputation, just right when I started walking, I went to a talent day. And I don't know, one of the coaches, he just gave me a shot. He, he saw that I was talented, but I couldn't show him anything yet. I didn't have a running leg yet. I, I was just there. Like the fact that I was there and I looked fit and I worked out, but I couldn't run yet because I didn't have the gear. So he just uh, gave me the, the benefit of the, of the doubt. And uh, yeah, he selected me as being talented. Then I, I got the chance to go start training, collect money to, to get my first running blade. And from there, uh, I started training and I got better and better. And now he asked me to come train at the National, uh, National uh, Olympic Training Center, like part-time. So it's, it's going quite well. I can't complain. That's how everything changed. Yeah, that's quite a story, man. Uh, so you were in Indonesia on vacation riding scooters and basically had an accident. And it ba- it caused you to be in, go to various hospitals and they each told you different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until the final hospital that they kind of had a correct, like you said uh, they were too late to correct what too, they were doing? Yeah, it was too late. Like the fifth day, they flew me over to Singapore to get help there because they wouldn't help me in Indonesia. Okay. And then they immediately uh, helped me. Yeah. So when you were in those first hospitals, did you know something was wrong? Did you feel like, did, were you second guessing the, the, the first few hospitals you went to? Yeah, I was. Um, like... In the first hospital, they didn't even properly speak English. So yeah. Communication with me was shit. 
I didn't trust that. So in the second hospital, that was a hospital which was uh, recommended to us by the, the Dutch instance that takes care of you when you get accidents abroad, you know. Yeah. They have a special special uh, thing for that. And um, they sent me to that hospital. I got there, got my diagnosis within like 20 minutes of getting there. So I was like, okay, that's good. But they didn't do anything, which was weird because I was in so much pain. And I didn't feel my toes, couldn't move anything, couldn't move my, my ankle joint or my knee. And, uh, but I was thinking, I trusted the, the medical uh, doctors that they knew what they were doing. So I thought, if you don't do anything, then it's not that bad. And uh, yeah, after some time, they, they, they told me a few days rest now that I would be fine. And then uh, I didn't believe that with the, the amount of pain I had. So I definitely was second guessing what they said. Yeah, it's funny. Like, well, it's not funny, but, you, you know, you're you're more aware of your own body. And it's, sometimes you second guess what other people tell you about how you feel. Is Does your accident have anything to do with why you're in medical school? No, but it has to do with the motivation that I have to. I have now to do it. I, I already got into it before the accident. Yeah. Um, because you have to sign in the year before and do tests, and then you deserve your place. And that took place like three months before the accident already. But after the accident, like I uh, had extra motivation to make sure that no one ever felt so helpless and hopeless like I did in those few days. So that's why I... Uh, and that's why I, I what I use as motivation. So yeah, it sounds like you're in a great spot now, right? You know, you're you're training for the Paralympics. You're in medical school. You know, the accident is years behind you. Probably at in the moment in the hospital, you're probably wondering what does my future look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I I knew that I could still do a lot, like almost. I knew that almost everything I still wanted to do would be possible, but only thing uh, that was left was like playing football, soccer, and uh, yeah, that was the only thing that I couldn't do. So that was what I was most uh, worried about. Yeah. So you're a soccer player, or, fo- or I guess correct me, correct myself, football player. <laughs> you you've always been kind of athletic and involved with sports. Yeah, I've been. I also did uh, four years of taekwondo. Okay. Fighting sport. Nice. And um, I just always, always, always playing football everywhere with everyone. So basically, it sounded like right after your surgery, you were trying to figure out your next athletic kind of adventure. Mm-hmm. So you, it didn't take much time for you to kind of get into what you're, you're training for now. It, it went from accident to hospital to trying to learn how to walk and get stronger to uh, learning to, to run and then to real training. It's just one straight line going up. Yeah. I, yeah. So your mindset's always been, you know, all right, what's next? But I'm sure there was a learning curve, you know, in terms of, you know, getting adjusted to having like a prosthetic limb. Can you can you walk me through the process of getting used to having a prosthetic limb? And yeah, I don't know how you get how they do it. They start with just the fitting. It's already already a thing. Like you. You just get your leg for the first time and you get to use it and stand on it for like 15 minutes. And then they check your uh, your residual limb if it's not too red or any blue or anything else. And then um, it, that increases with the days. And after one week, maybe you're allowed to get out of the bridge. For me, it went faster than that. Like you have a walking bridge where you, you have to stay in. For me, I I was allowed to get out of that like for the first time I think or the second time already, 
but then you can't walk in with you. You have someone to support you and crutches to support you. Um, yeah, then you, so you learn to walk in the bridge, then you learn to walk with crutches, then you learn to walk with a walking stick, and it's all depending on you, how long you, how much time you use uh, in those different phases. Uh, from two walking sticks, you go to one, and then without walking sticks, then you just, you get stronger, and then you learn how to walk uh, further and more often, and, keep the leg on for the whole day because it's it's not easy to to have that thing around your residual limb all day. It's not very comfortable at all times. So that's also something you have to get used to. Yeah, it's interesting. So you went from, you know, learning to walk with your new prosthetic leg to now you're sprinting with it. That's quite a, a jump. Yeah. How long did it take you to get used to sprinting? Um, I would say three months to really get used to it. Um, like six weeks of learning to run and then six weeks of getting used to run faster. But it's still, still every adjustment that they do on the leg, it's still something that I have to get used to. Okay. Like... If they if they adjust the knee like um, twist it a bit or they adjust uh, they they connect it to the socket more outwards or inwards in a, a new socket then yeah you still have to get used to it so every change is again a new challenge and may start over again gotcha not completely but you know it's uh, slowly going up like back and forth but still going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, I've had an Olympic, a Paralympic athlete on, who his name's Lex Gillette, and he he's blind and he's a long jumper. Yeah, he has the world record in for you know blind long jump. Yeah, which I think is awesome. Yeah. So you you're you're in the hundred meter. I think hundred meter. Yeah, hundred meter. It's three hundred yards. I think. 300 huh? yards and, and it's just one straight sh- sprint yeah straight 300 yards i think so that's far man it's i i don't know about i think one yard is like 30 centimeters let me look it i'm gonna look it up yeah look it up uh 100 meter is 109 yards oh <laughs> never mind no nah, it's all good <laughs> you know the united states we're on this weird thing yeah <laughs> the rest of the world is yeah y'all have your special yeah. thing so 100 100 meters or 110 yards how long did it take you to get to full full-on sprint you know from zero to 100 you know like mm, um, i think like uh, how long after the amputation yeah yeah I think nine months. Okay, nine months. That's not fu- that's not as long as I thought, man. Maybe, maybe a bit longer, but maybe maybe ten months. Yeah. But th- at that time, it was one hundred percent. Now it wouldn't be close to that. So, I have a few questions myself that I'm just interested in in terms of you know having a prosthetic limb. How does it affect the blood flow of the rest of your body? You know, like, because you used to have a... Yeah, I, I wondered about that too. Yeah, like... I've, I've thought about that too, but I don't know. I I don't think so. But what, what are your thoughts? I was just curious because, you know, when you have your, your leg, is it's a big part of your body, you know, that, you know, there's all these, like, veins and your blood flow going through it. Do you have less blood in your body now? Yeah, less blood because I'm, I'm like smaller. Gotcha. So your body just kind of adapts to having less blood, I guess. Is that... Yeah, kind of... but there's also less uh, tissue to provide blood to, so you don't need it. Gotcha. And then does your your left leg, does it take extra training and you have to target your left leg differently when you train? Uh, no. I target my left leg the same, but I have to target the right leg differently. Okay. Like the prosthetic, like the residual 
limb that's still there, I should target that differently because the other side I can just train normally and then it it has the same reaction as a normal athlete I guess. But for the right side it's different. Okay. Because the right side it it when I do weightlifting for example, the right side is always uh less activated, less involved because it's hard to get the techniques right and everything. Okay. So you focus on that a little bit more. Okay. And when it comes to how your brain processes your leg, where 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 was your leg amputated? At what part of your body? Is it do you do you have some of your leg? Yeah, it's just uh, like I think 10 15 centimeters above the knee. Okay. Okay. So somewhere around there. So ba- it's basically your brain's still able to to like just move that part and then that's kind of how it functions with the new limb on there. Yeah. Uh, I have a, my hip is fine, so that moves. Sure. My knee doesn't move. I don't have a knee. Okay. So. And how many different kind of prosthetic limbs did you try out or before you, you picked one? Mm-hmm. I saw on your Instagram you have two different ones, one for warming up and one for sprinting, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for walking I tried four different ones before getting to the – to the right knee, and I tried uh, three feet before the, I got the right feet, foot, and I had, I don't know how many sockets, maybe 15. Okay. Um, so, and then with running, I had like maybe eight sockets and before this one, but that doesn't mean, for sockets, for sockets it doesn't mean you just have to get new ones every once in a while, especially in the in the first years after amputation. So it doesn't mean that the old ones, all 50, uh, 14 old ones were bad. But for running, I had eight different uh, sockets, I think. Uh, and then only two knees. I tried one other knee before I, had, I got this one. And I have tried four blades or five blades and i still use two of them to this day um, one is for actual sprinting and one is for warming up so jogging and yeah warming up okay yeah so it sounds like uh, it's, it's kind of like you have different tools basically for whatever you're doing you know mm-hmm. and and the one you use when you sprint it it has a very cool look to it um, it looks futuristic almost. <laughs> yeah, people say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it's nice. That looks. It looks good. Are those limbs expensive? Yeah. So, um, in euros, it's f- around fourteen thousand to get a whole, uh, a whole leg, uh, running leg. And for the daily. A uh, prosthetic leg, you can vary between a whole leg for maybe uh, 12,000 to 50, like five zero thousand. Okay. So it varies. Yeah, it is. It is quite expensive. Depends on what, what you want and what you can handle and what fits you best. Okay. So, you know, I, I was doing some research on you, you know, to kind of prep for the interview to know what to talk about with you about yeah. and I came across like a story of when you were in the hospital and someone mentioned that um, it was when you you were in the hospital after your accident someone mentioned you could become the new Blade Runner mm-hmm. they were like well, why don't you what is a Blade Runner a Blade Runner someone who runs with a prosthetic leg with a carbon fiber foot Okay, what what's the you know the origin of that like why it's called um, Blade Runner like it's I think they do, they don't know how to how to call the the foot that we used to run and that's why they call it blades. Gotcha. It's uh, a cool name. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool name. Yeah, that's I think that's how it came to be. Yeah, and then that comment did that comment have like a 
a, it kind of planted a seed for you in terms mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. yeah planted the seed for me i i just because of someone saying that that sped up the process so i started looking for uh, videos of the paralympic games online and then i was like i want to do that too and that's uh how it started oh nice nice and i was still in the hospital so that was one of the nurses coming uh to my room saying that what i liked about that was you know it's like how some comments of just like positivity you know can plant seeds that you know create kind of like a reason a big move yeah a big move yeah and you know if if you focus on you know if you're in the hospital you're obviously going through a traumatic time you you you're probably likely in a negative mindset and positivity is always needed mm-hmm. um so I, I think that was neat that, you know, a nurse planted that seed, you know, because you were an athlete before, so you were like, all right, how can I keep being an athlete? Yeah, exactly. And how can I, how can I be myself and still do what I used to do? Yeah, exactly. So, and here you are, you know, you're training for the Paralympics. I have some questions about that. So how do you qualify for the Paralympics games? So it differs for... From country to country, you have to start off with you have like the Paralympic norms. Um, I don't know what they are, but they are not as strict. I don't know what they are because they are not as strict as our national norms. So I, okay. I don't know. But our national norms for Dutch athletes um, is you have to run 12 6 under 100 meters uh, to get a yeah, two. That's the the time you need to get selected. But uh, as a country, you also need to gain slots. So, and the slots are just places. If I go to, for example, if I do a World Cup or European Cup or big reason I win it, then I can I can get a slot for the country, so I can win a place. And then it's up to the coach. Uh, the national coach who gets that place and I need to be the fastest one who ran the uh, the limit who got the limit of 12.6 or below the limit of 12.6 to be able to get that place and okay. that's how you qualify for the games okay okay but let's say two guys run on the 12.6 but we only have one place that only the fastest one or the one the national coach thinks has the most chance can go. Gotcha. So, you know, I'm sure the Paralympic community is is uh, supportive, but there's also an, probably an extreme amount of com- competitiveness there. Um, does everyone get along for the most part, or is there like some rivalries? No, we have some good situation here in the Netherlands, man. Oh, really? I don't know. Yeah, uh, before, like, I don't know how, how long before I got into uh, this Paralympic world, but maybe two years before that, there were two uh, national coaches for uh, track and field, Paralympic track and field. And then uh, the national organization of the, the track and field, Okay. they decided to cut... Uh, into the money that they would give to the Paralympic sport. but And one coach was, yeah, he agreed at some point, but the other one was like, no, I'm not going to do that. So he left or had to go, I don't know exactly, but then he set up his own team and some of the athletes preferred him over the other coach and they went with him. So they left the national training center and they went to train with him somewhere else and they have their own team now. So now some athletes like I could also make that choice to ask if I could train in that team, uh, if I wouldn't be happy with uh, what's going on, what's going on at the national training center. So it's weird. Like not everyone trains in the same place. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's also where maybe it's not, there's no, there are no arguments going on like face to face or out in public, but I think there must be some bad blood somewhere. And, 
I, I don't know exactly, but it's a weird situation. I've always found that, but I wasn't there when everything was created. So I'm not the best to, uh, to talk about that, but that's what I know. Or I think I know. So typically there's one national training center and that's where everyone goes and trains, but it sounds like in the Netherlands, there's two, two coaches and two teams yeah. and kind of complicates it. You're probably like, which team do I go train with? Yeah. Does, does it affect my qualifications? Um, yeah, exactly. But also for them, like if you imagine you don't train at the national training center, then you maybe you're, you're less in contact with the national coach who actually has the most power sure. compared to the other one. So, yeah. Yeah. Somewhere at some time you will be in a, it won't be beneficial at some time. But I don't know. Hopefully your time is just so much faster than everyone's that it's just a no brainer, you know, who competes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For me, I've chosen for the national. So uh, that's why I will be going, but as long as it is still fair, then you won't hear me complain about this whole situation. Everyone should be able to go where they want freely and choose their own team, teammates and uh, facilities. So. Okay, that yeah, it's interesting. I never had to think about that um, that being a problem, but I, I could see how that could be problematic. Um, but going back to training, you know, you you're a you do the you're you are training for the hundred meter. Um, dash is that what it's called 100, 100 meter dash or is it just 100 uh, meter? you can call it a 100 meter dash cool I don't know if, if that's a thing <laughs> <laughs> alright so yeah, let's say 100 meter sprint so your your part of your training is actually sprinting and practicing you know speed and te- running technique what were the first what did the first days look like of learning to sprint with your, your prosthetic limb versus how it looks now? Are, are you, do you feel like you've mastered it? Um, no, <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, but the first days were really about trusting. So uh, not being afraid to fall, daring to trust on landing on your leg and uh, getting it forward uh, in front of your body again pushing forward and uh, not being so stiff. Like when you're afraid to fall, you're really tense everywhere, like in your shoulders, in your back. Um, That's all in the past now. And it's also really tired thing. First few times it's uh, someone told me, the old world champion told me that that's research has been done. Like when amputees start running, they uh, consume seven times more energy to do the same thing as a non-amputee. So for me, if I did training for like half an hour, in the beginning, it felt like three and a half. Wow. And uh, these days, I think it still feels like more than it would be if I had two legs. But it's not that it's not as hard as it used to be, but we, I train much harder. So I'm not, I'm not caring about falling. I'm just caring about getting everything done and do it right and do it fast or as, as fast as I have to and focus on the right things. So right now I, the running part, like the trusting myself and the prosthetic leg that's over and it's now more about the actual sprinting and, getting the distance covered and doing the same as my teammates. You know? Interesting. Because I also started on my own. Like I started in the rehabilitation center, learning to run and sprint. And I was on my own. And now I trained with a, a group of non-disabled uh, people. So that's also very much different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure yeah, that sounds like quite a process from, you know, learning to walk to sprint and then to also sprint that distance, 100 meters. That's quite quite a a ways to sprint. You've 200 as well. And 200, yeah. So, And it sounds like, you know, you, you said you haven't mastered it yet, but you're getting pretty close. Yeah, 
pretty close, but still so yet so far away. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the, those la last steps are the hardest. That's why there are so little people so fast because the last steps are the hardest. So you just have to take your time and trust. That's that's very cool. And in terms of weight training. What kind of exercises are you doing there? Yeah, almost everything is the same for me, but my execution is uh, it's different. Um, for example, we do a lot of Olympic lifts or so, uh, shrugs, uh, clean and jerk, uh, just normal cleans, uh, deadlifts, squats, uh, Romanian deadlifts, good mornings. Um, Reactive jumping, all those kind of things. Uh, those are the things I do, and uh, I think it's the same as everyone else would do. But for me, the execution is different. I just have to look for the limit of what I can still do. Yeah. Like if it's not possible for me to, I can't go with my hip. My hip can't go below my knee in a squat because then my right leg won't ever be able to uh, extend again. That's just physio physio like physiologically impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I, that's why I was asking because I was thinking about like how you know do you squat and you know you you mentioned you deadlifted. You know, so, yeah, deadlift so, is just normal, and uh, in the cleans the the explosive part is also the same, but the the catching part is different. So. It's hard for me to catch it with my knees bended because you really have to be really fast. Like in 0.1 second, you have to be from up to down very fast. But my right leg, it can't bend that fast. There's a resistance on it that you really can use really well when walking, yeah. but not that well in the in the gym. Uh, and you can switch it off the resistance, but then you have no stability. So then you fall easily. So uh, you don't want to take that risk. So say... Say I wanted to get faster. <laughs> Say I just mm -hmm. wanted to become a faster sprinter. What kind of workout should I do? You do uh, explosive workouts. So everything uh, start to do. Yeah, first it's technical stuff. So you learn uh, to do a, a shrug, or you learn how to clean and jerk, or you learn how to clean. I would start off with learning to clean and squat and deadlift, and from there. Um, you will get faster when you can produce more force with your legs, you know. Mm. And if your if your calves are uh, their reactivity is high enough to uh, re return that uh, force. So if your lower legs and your lower body, uh, your upper body, your upper leg, if your upper legs and your yeah. upper body produce more force, and you are able to uh, have that reactive calves that you can return it fast enough they will be faster so you just focus on getting stronger explosive and reactive calves uh, strong calves that can hold uh, the force that you can do that by doing cleans reactive jumps uh, the, the exercise i just mentioned like it's quite everyone for the the core part everyone does the same exercise it's just it differs in the uh, in the the ones you choose besides that. Okay. Also, for example, if you if you're uh, like me, uh, unilateral above knee, or you can be bilateral below knee. Maybe you you get more benefit from different exercises. Gotcha. But if guys like normal guys like you, if you want to get faster, you just do uh, everything. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like it's more in the weight room than out like actually practicing running. No, no, that's not true. You have to spend more time on the track, but in the weight room is just uh, to build complementary. The... Yeah, gotcha. To build the, you have you are the you learn to drive on the track. Like if you would be a Formula One car, you learn to drive it on the track. But like the gym is where you. Get a, a faster, more powerful, more horsepower in your gotcha. motor. Gotcha. Okay. That's great to know. You know, I'm, I'll I'll let you know if my uh if I get faster. 
<laughs> Let me know. <laughs> I'm gonna start working on some explosive things. I you get below that 4.9. Yeah, yeah, let's see if I can beat okay. my high school self. And what about diet? Is do you you uh, are you big on diet? Do you watch what you eat? Do you have specific? Do you take any like dietary supplements, supplements or anything like that? Yeah, I uh, I watch. I've been watching what I eat. I eat healthy since ever since I was 17, and I started going to the gym next to playing football. That was when I started to look into, uh, check YouTube on what this other guys say that have more experience. And uh, with the years I learned more. Um, and now it's, I'm just used to eating, he eating healthy. It's not really diff difficult for me. But what I always watch are the protein intake and just enough uh, vegetables uh, and fruits. I don't really watch carbohydrates and fats, but I use carbohydrates. Like I use it as a something I eat before training. So before training, I try to eat more carbohydrates, and after training, I try to eat those as little as possible and eat more fat fats. Sure. And then I know what healthy where I can find healthy fats. I have uh, peanuts with the uh, raisins here, so nice. uh, I, I eat that and. Um, yeah, I, I, I now I have the perfect guy with those with the doctor I told you about mm -hmm. with, uh, that I trained with this morning. He knows everything about uh, dieting, so he will tell me more. Uh, and on the national training center, they also give you advice and uh, tell you, explain to you what you gotta know. And for supplementation, I protein powder. I've been using uh, that for quite a while. Lately, I haven't, but I used to use that. It's quite easy source of protein. Um, they also have like amino amino acids next to that. You can take them. I used to do that. Uh, omega threes, so those uh, magnesium against the uh, grams. Uh, what else? Uh, creatine. Like every three. Three to five months, you take that, and you try to at least get one peak a year in the competition season, so in the summer, and also in the winter. But now this year is different with Corona. It's no, it doesn't look like there will be competition in the winter. And what other supplements do I have? I think that's it. Also caffeine. I took caffeine before uh, races. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I used to take, believe it or not, I used to take some sports supplements whenever I was playing uh, uh, football. So I, yeah, I'm kind of familiar with, with some of it. I used to take, I took creatine. I took like a pre-workout, you mm. know, I think it was called something crazy, like NO shotgun yeah, or something like that. that you know, oh, it's supposed to give you like, you know, the pump I'm, and the energy. I'm not a big fan of uh, pre-workouts. You're not? No. Does it make you too like jittery or you you just don't think it works? I don't know. It works, but the sensation people feel from it doesn't have any the thing, the ingredient in it that gives you the sensation, thinkly sensation that doesn't have any effect. Only the caffeine and the I think alanine, they have effects, but you can also take them separately without all the like it's all always it's also always tasty, like uh, strawberry taste uh, yeah you know blueberry that's not healthy you know there's always <laughs> sugar shit in there so it's better for you to take those ingredients you, you get you know you get to know what this uh, active ingredients are and if you want to take supplements then take those separately in pill form with water um, and also with the pre-workout people get used to that so they they get used to taking it every time, all the time. And after some time with, uh, especially with caffeine, you get used to it. You get a tolerance and then uh, there's no effect anymore. Yeah. And I, I have a friend who played college football and like American football, you know, and he, he, the NCAA here, they like put a limit on how much caffeine could be in your, mm -hmm. your system, you know? Oh really? Yeah, and he he, but he was taking like caffeine pills, you know, like. Mm, I did that too. 
and that stuff, you know, I drink a lot of coffee, but even though to me that was too much caffeine, I couldn't handle it. Uh, one one pill is, is, I think it's two or three coffees. It's not the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the ones I uh, once took. Yeah. And I'll, I'll drink a coffee before going to the gym or something like that just to help me out. Yeah, that's but fine. So that's my good, new pre workout. <laughs> oh, you, you take it like a good way to go about it is only using it when you. Normally you work out at ten, but not to that day you can only go at seven, so you're really tired. Yeah. And for that day you use it, or maybe one day you really have to get all the whole day you're busy, and you have to get work done, and you can only go to the gym at ten p.m. and then you take it then. But when you work out at your normal times and you're just not that fatigued, then don't take it. Okay, I remember. There's also a way you can go about it. And do you, do you take creatine monohydrate, or do you take the other? forms of it monohydrate i take whey protein after i work out mm-hmm. the best is isolated yeah it's the way isolate um because in the other way proteins is often more per 100 grams is off often or close to or more than uh the amount of protein per 100 grams of powder than actual uh carbs yeah, I take the, uh, it's like Optimum Nutrition's gold standard uh, whey protein. I don't know if that no, sounds familiar cool. to you. No, I don't know that, but it sounds it sounds high quality. Yeah, I don't know. It's something I've been taking, I took in high school and it's just, it's the only thing I know. So I just mm-hmm. kind of stick with it. But yes, yeah, the whole world is crazy. You know, you go into like a vitamin store, you know, and there's all these advertisements everywhere for, you know, yeah. brightly colored like packages like no shotgun you know explode you know and it's like yeah i'm gonna get so yeah strong. i wanted that i'm gonna have that yeah it's like i'm gonna get so strong when i pay 60 dollars for this and uh, it only lasts like three weeks and then uh yeah. it can be a rabbit hole of money so i i, I like your style i think yeah you know creatine. also for the whey protein i found yeah. that uh i get a lot of acne from it so the the normal uh, whey proteins that they sell, like in Europe, uh, for example, XXL Nutrition and uh, My Protein are really popular. Um, I use their products though, but just for the um, whey protein, I found that I get a lot of acne, so I'm looking for a tasty uh, vegan protein powder or a non. Uh, how do you say that? Because it's dairy, right? Yeah, it's dairy. Yeah, yeah. I'm not I've tried vegan protein non processed protein powder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. That makes total sense. You know, I, I don't even drink milk anymore. Like dairy, dairy. My dairy products are limited. I drink almond milk, and but I do drink whey protein, and I always feel like it's it's like it's like sometimes it reminds me of drinking like whole milk or something like that. Mm, mm. But yeah, true. Anyways, diet supplements. It's all fascinating to me, so I wanted to pick your brain on it. Um, so oh, we've been talking almost an hour. I don't want to take, take up your whole day. Um, so, but I, I do have a question for you Two two questions left. Um, and the first one would be what advice would you give to someone who is new to their prosthetic limb? Mm-hmm. I would tell them to not see any limits. Like, um, to look, look for what's possible, like not online or anything, just for yourself. Just be, think about it as a kid with uh, a football or something like that. You try everything and you see what works and you try again until it works or if it, if it never works, then it never works. But you just keep on trying and uh, you have to be patient and smart about your uh, you, you can't go too fast, so you have to be smart about it. Okay. Yeah, that's that's good advice. You know, just at your own pace, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then at your but own. But limitless. But limitless. At the yeah. same time. Yeah. yeah. I like that. That's that's good advice. And then the, I guess, you know, each episode I close out by I ask each, each guest I have on if there's like a specific nonprofit or charity or just – organization that you want to give a shout out to or promote that you think people need to know about Stichting Gospel who's that it's uh 
It's a charity organization who uh, who was set up for a kid who died of uh, brain cancer, and now they collect money uh, for it. It's for research. So, can you say that again? It's, th- it's like um, in Dutch, the name for organization is Stichting. S T I C H T I N G. Casper, and the name of the kid is Casper, like the 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 ghost. Casper, yeah, that's awesome. You so it all you know they they collect money for research, and it was has to do with brain cancer. Yeah. What's your Instagram information for people listening if they want to find you there? Um, you can look on Noah Mboyamba or Noah Nkenda. Okay. Then you'll find me. Awesome. Is is there you anything? Spell it. Yeah, how do you spell, you spell it? it? Noah just with an H and then um, N-K-E-N-D-A. That's my second name. It's not my last yeah, name. Yeah, you have a very cool Instagram feed, so everyone should go check it out. And there's there's cool videos of you know Noah doing his thing, training, running. Yeah, You'll get to see him. Leave me a like, leave me a comment, leave me a follow, man. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I know the games are on hold. What what's next for you now you just waiting um, training what's up next maybe is one competition in the winter that would be na- indoor national uh, nationals indoor uh, hopefully that continues um, and for me next year um, the Europeans the re- European competitions would be like European Cup uh, European Championships um, maybe I can get into that I think I'm fast enough. And just uh, the normal Grand, Grand Prix I go to in uh, Germany, Switzerland. Uh, might go to France, but we'll see what's possible. Nice, man. I, I look forward to following your uh, your path, you know, to see. Hopefully I can see you compete one day. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. yeah, and if you see, or if you see Lex, you know, Reach out to him and be like, you know, I, I did uh, this see through podcast too. And then maybe he'll remember, maybe not. It was a while back, but he was a very cool guy, just like yourself. So, uh, thanks, man. So, yeah, thanks for, again, man, thanks for taking the time to chat with me. And uh, I wish you all the best with my your pleasure, training. Man. And uh, I think you have a very, very unique, cool story that I think people will love to hear. So, thanks for sharing it. No problem. You're welcome. All right, man. Well, that's a wrap on episode 15 of the See-Through Podcast. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Noah. For those of you new to the podcast, I release episodes every Sunday, so I hope you'll tune in again next week. As always, I very much appreciate you listening. If you haven't yet, make sure to follow the podcast on social media. The handle is at See-Through Pod. And if you're listening on YouTube, do me a huge favor and subscribe to the channel. For other info on the podcast, just visit seethroughpod.com. Stay transparent, everyone.